crowd I'ma make it go wild I'm original and I told you so I'm a kid in the candy store With the leather on the denim I ain't the cure, I'm the venom If you wanna find me, find the taillight Something's coming in, you're gonna wanna take a red eye It's time to go It's time to go Get ready Good afternoon. What up Wednesday? It is great to see you all. Oh my goodness. Comments are already popping. Thank you so much to everybody who's already joining in. Welcome to the show. I'm going to try to say the keywords a little, a little less times, fewer times. I'm going to say it fewer times for Elle's sake and Simon's because they're the ones doing the uh, transcriptions. But thank you for coming. I am Keely Dunn, FH Empire's Umpire Whisperer, and I'm really excited today. We're we're talking about some things that have flown into my DMs and into the YouTubes. So it's great. People are starting to be more uh, active and engaging on the YouTube videos that I post, and I've got a series of questions from one coach, and then I also have um, I have a question from James that uh, is very long. And very involved. And we're gonna we're actually gonna switch up the order and do that first. So the first thing we're gonna talk about today is how do you manage and how do you determine when the free hit is actually taken? Yes, we're gonna do that. And then we're gonna talk about the difference between rules and regulations. We're gonna talk about the importance of an umpire. That's gonna be a really quick one. It's like paramount. And then how a control elevator is used to manage a game. And to be more precise, control escalator. That's what I like to call it. So uh, I think it's going to be a great show. And you're here. If you're new, please let us know. Because there is a huge, huge 13 community out there who are just dying to say hello and get to know you, as am I. So please say you're new. And we'll, we'll greet you accordingly. If you're watching on the replay, you can put a comment in the comments yeah today and uh put hashtag replay or hashtag replay squad if you're saucy like that and if you have any questions don't worry I come back and today is the proof people ask me questions and I come back and it means that you're on and your question is up for the next what up Wednesday sorry that's the second time I said it ah okay comment section I know right Let's see. First of all, who else here? My favorite time of the day. Simon was first. How is all that feeling? How does it feel to be first for the first time? I think. Been here since six, got sidetracked. But now you have the Merlot. Thank you, Rachel. I'm glad that you are set. Set. Very important. This is amazing, you guys. Uh, Simon's got his tea. 
I have some cooler tea and I am not going to be refreshing this because you may have heard on the interwebs, it's a little bit on the hot side in Western Canada this week and definitely, pardon me, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. So Leela, who's in the chat, has it way worse actually than I do uh, because I think it's only going to be 37 today. It's only 33 right now, but they've had it worse uh, right out there on the coast. The mountains are always a nice barrier of things. Either it keeps the snow on this side of the mountains or it keeps the heat on that side of the mountains. But anyway, I'm fine. I have AC. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> when I went to the salon today, as you may have noticed, also had AC. So there you go. I also promised my stylist that I was going to do a screenshot of the first comment on my hair because she says do people notice and what yeah they notice trust me so I'm going to screenshot it and then I'm going to put it up on my personal Instagram there you go Neil says hi do you know that we have a discord channel <laughs> I'll talk about that more in a sec Loving the discords. Oh, you already survived. Okay, so it's already moving across towards us and then out to the east. That's what I figured. High 40s. Yeah, they're not in Canada. No, we wouldn't expect it either. Ask all the Canadians who don't have air conditioning, which don't include me. Um, let's see. Yep. AC in the car. Oh, but not in the house. Leela. Kaylee umpire bag gloves because cold. Yes, indeed. That's what I usually say. Lucio, good to see you, friend. And yes, very glad. It's tough. Lucio's got a little one, so heat and babies don't usually mix. There you go. Oh, yeah, I'm doing fine. Brent's here. Hey, friend. Haven't seen you for a hot minute. Great to have you. General Raptor, Kyle. I think I, did I out you? I never know with people's names if I'm allowed to say their real names. But Kyle from South Africa is here. Great to see you, friend. Lou is here. And Scott, always glad to have you, Scott. Gopi is here. How are things? How are things, Gopi? How are things happening in, in your area? Our third wave for COVID is whew, on a steep decline and things are loosening up. And I'm getting my second shot on Friday night. Wish me luck. I had AZ the first time, I'm getting Pfizer the second time, and I hear that that is a whopper of a combination, friends. Woo, it's going to be a party. So 8.30 Friday night, getting my shot, and I'm expecting Saturday to be an absolute <laughs> show. That's what I've been told. It's not going to be fun. Yes, thank you everybody who's already hit like, and if you've already subscribed, you're my favorites. Uh, seriously, you're my favorites if you subscribed. And yes, Nails has even put up the songs. I don't, I don't know if you can get individual songs off audio like that or if you have to have a subscription, but it is a great song. It's, you know, I keep thinking I should change it up and then I'm like, nope, too much fun. And there it is. Okay, hang on, hang on. That's the screenshot. So it's cool in Antwerp. Stain, don't worry. Well, we're going to do our best to send this across the Atlantic and then foist it upon you. I hope you like that. And Simon. Okay, second screenshot for my stylist. Okay. <laughs> yup, welcome. Are you new? Have you been to a YouTube? I think you might be new. Let's give him the, the new treatment anyway. Let's do it. Elle's here. Keely and crew. Bonjour. And yes, so, okay. Nils is jumping. I'm going to star this, and then I'm going to put this up later. Liz Spencer, thank you for coming. And yes, isn't it? Thank you. A little three-week refresh toner, because my hair gets very brassy in the summer. It gets the color of these lamps and that painting. That's, that was my hair color last week. I can tell because I'm looking at a screenshot of, I don't know why I have it up there. I have the website up and my hair is yellow, very yellow. George, 
This is your first YouTube. Everybody say hi to George. First What Up Wednesday, I think. If my memory sucks, this is going to be really embarrassing. Thank you. I think it's going to be fine. Your second job. Yeah. And I hear that that's usually true if you have a really bad first job, if it's the same vaccine. But I'm being all like, sassy with it and deciding to mix up my AZ and an mRNA because from my very careful research on some very informative blogs, <laughs> I'm taking the advice of our Canadian health authorities who say that mixing the two is actually a really good idea. And yeah, I'm going there. Okay. It would make you sad. I agree. It's better for you. Thank you for telling me, Gopi. I'm glad to hear that. Very, very grateful. You're not new. Damn it. Oh, I just want to make a big deal out of people. I just, I'm just glad to see you. Okay. That's all it is. You'll probably get your first shot at the end of the summer and Pfizer for you since you're under 18 years old. Okay, good. Don't hesitate though. If you can get it sooner, Aline, do it. It's good. Oh, Yop is in the discord. Yeah. Okay. Good to here. And everybody says, welcome, George. <laughs> but you lurked, didn't you, George? Whatever. Let's just make a big deal out of people. Oh, and he's a friend of Simon. So there you go. Good to hear. Okay. Nick is here. <laughs> I don't know why he's going to be a policeman tonight, but if this is like some kind of YMCA warm up, I'm watching you. Yes. Oh, tell me more, Simon. Tell me more about that. Gideon, the professor's in the house. And Joe gets his first shot next Friday. Okay. I hear the key is just over drinking on the water. That's what I've heard. Four liters, just bang it back and you're going to be a lot better, which is not good because that interferes with my wine drinking. <sighs> James, you're here. Your question is coming up, and I think I'm going to do it first because it's so interesting. It might take me about, it won't take me a Keeley hour. It might take me a real hour. Mark's here. Oh, great to see you, friend. Okay. What are my quick little announcements now that I've said hi to everybody in the world? Where are my announcements? Okay. Did you know we have a Discord? <laughs> As... Sir Niels has proclaimed, this is turning out to be a pretty dope way for me to um, handle questions. Um, I get a lot of DMs out there in these streets, out here in these streets, a lot of DMs. And I absolutely love them and I want to answer them all. And I do answer them all. But you know what's really cool is if people can if people ask me in a forum where I can share the answers and we can share the discussion with everybody, because not only do I get to give the information to more people all at once, but you get to help teach me if I have flaws in my thinking and flaws in my explanation. And that is really important to me. So if only, if I tell any one people, they go, okay, cool, that's fine. And then, but if I tell 10 people, then one of those people would be like, but Keely, have you met my friend rule 9.13 or whatever the case might be? And then I'm like, oh, I got to think about that more. So I really, I, I want the dialogue with more people. Discord is the place to do it. So hopefully um, this link doesn't always work for everybody. So thanks to Niels, who's constantly <laughs> putting up the uh, the full Discord link, you might need to put a space in there to make that clickable, Niels, in another post, which you will do in, in a moment, I'm sure. So come on over. It looks intimidating, but it's not. And it's fun to learn, and you can hang out with all the cool kids. So there you go. That is the Discords. Yesterday, friends... <laughs> that sound effect sucks. Um... We ran this aerials workshop and we had a full house, which was dope. And we tried a format, uh, Rob and I, that 
we haven't used before, and it's not very common in umpire teaching where we just basically, and if, if Paul Reeves is here, um, who else from yellow? I'm blanking. There are a few other yellow people for sure that were, were at the session. People are going to tell me in a second, but what we did is we, we ran through, we took polls on clips and then we talked about the principles and we got the participants. I hear this is called learner centric teaching. This is what I've learned from the FIH Academy. And they, we teased out the, the principles and, and really engaged some awesome conversations and did start to get into the way that things are going in this. So I really enjoyed this. I'm thinking of doing um, a similar one on my own with FH umpires, and I really liked the format. So I just want to thank everybody who who did come, and don't sleep on these. Don't sleep on these uh, workshops if they're at the right level for you. We needed to make sure that this the material was going to the people who see aerials on a regular basis and have some experience with them and know what challenges they're facing on the pitch when discovering them. So uh, we had a we had a great crowd for that. Um, people were, were right in tune with that, um, that level and it turned out to be a fantastic thing. So I just wanted to say thanks and I just wanted to, you know, no, not applaud myself, but I'm just, I was, I had a lot of fun and I learned a ton. Rob and I occasionally disagreed over clips, which was fun because it was like mom and dad having a fight. Don't be alarmed, kids. Everything's fine. And it was really hilarious. So I enjoyed that. Um, what else do we need to talk about? Oh, okay. Just today, hot off the podcast's RSS feeds, I sat down for a uh, brief, it, was, it seemed like it went by so fast, brief moment in time with the fine fellows of Talk Hockey Radio. And the podcast is out this week. And talk about mind benders. We talked about ideas that the guys had for changing, shifting the rules in certain ways to make them better. And so it was uh, like a round table discussion and and hopefully I didn't shoot all the ideas down too much. Fraser was a little bit <laughs> like, do you like anything I'm talking about? I'm like, nope, no, I'm just kidding. Some of them, some of the ideas were really good. And what I liked about it is nobody saying, ah, we just have to throw at this rule and get rid of it. It was very, what if we introduce this twist, this change of wording, very subtle things to help make the game better. And having those discussions doesn't just, you know, it's, it's not useless if this never gets to the rules committee. It actually, um, it helps us understand what's actually in front of us better. So there were a couple of suggestions that I don't think made it into the podcast we talked about. And I'm like, actually, that's what the rule is right now. And they're like, oh. So have a listen. Uh, if you go to link, linktree.ee forward slash talk hockey radio, that's their link tree off their Instagram. You can go find them as well on Instagram and follow the links into the link tree to go find them. Um, they are an interesting and fun little podcast alongside all of my other podcast listening. It's, it's definitely worth your time. So perfect. Uh, <laughs> so Elle's talking about the fact that we had a huddle on Monday and that was the first time she's heard the real me. <laughs> There was a lot of this, a lot of this. <laughs> oh, that's probably why I laugh when anybody calls me a lady. Cause I'm like, mm, nope, not true. AJ was there. Thank you, Nick. I remembered AJ and yes, there we go. <laughs> Even Nick is chiming on the likes. Oh, why no whistle in the other D old school? Casper Stevens. Casper, I think you're new. It's great to have you. 
Let's talk about that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Everybody's ahead of this. Ian's late to the party. But let's come back to that. Casper, why no whistle in the other D? Is that old school? No. This is this is outlined in the rule book and this is where it says that umpires have primary responsibility over one circle let's see if i can find it really quickly do 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 do, do. is it in the umpiring section which isn't 10 which isn't 9 <laughs> which isn't 7 dang it's like i haven't seen these rules for a hot minute this is why you have to keep reading the rules, friends. Ah, here we go. 11.3. Each umpire is, is responsible for the free hits in um, decisions on free hits in the circle, penalty corners, penalty strokes, and goals in one half of the field. Okay, so that's, it's actually in the rules, um, Casper. And the reason for this is because we want to make it easier for players to understand where the decisions are coming from and give the controlling umpire who should have the best position to see what's going on the first opportunity to make the decisions. And then they can take advice from their controlling umpire colleague. So there are times when you can negotiate side agreements with your colleague. And I will do that, for example when a free hit should be awarded to the defending team. And I want that decision to come quickly because I want to avoid any dangerous scenarios from occurring. And it's a better alternative than me waiting, wondering, players are reacting, I'm looking around for my friend, maybe we don't have radios, and my friend can't show me in time that it's supposed to be a free hit for the defense. It's like going for a corner. Okay, um, so... I will have that express, explicit conversation with my colleague in the pre-match chat and say, hey, if I miss a free hit for the defense and you know that I'm unsighted, I'm okay with you taking that. I would rather the players are safe and hey, what if that would promote a quick break up the other end and promote some great hockey to have that right there at that moment? Go, go nuts. I trust you, friend. There you go. Okay, so that's a little bit of an aberration on what is technically in the rules, but that is what we generally look for. Okay, everything else is cooperation and verbal communication. So I hope that helps, Casper, and welcome. I'm going to try to learn how to do a Moira Rose accent. Welcome. I don't know what she says. We'll figure it out. Oh, the huddles are great. Such an easy way just to chat through anything hockey-based that you want. Yep, that's what we do. Easy chats. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I don't know what's happening here, but Nick is provoking. He is like fishing and he is catching a bait because Niels is to the rules, to the podcast, to the Discord. Awesome. I love it. You guys are great. Oh, the the here's the link to the huddle. So this is for FHU 3T yellow. And if I can show you the scene, is it here? Yeah, it's here. There you go. So this is this is where you find it. Green is the first step if you just want to come and help support, which is wonderful. But yellow is this full-fledged mentorship. And there you have an opportunity to join in a huddle once a week. And we sit around for a Keeley hour. And we talk about what's on your umpiring brain. And that might be that you've just come off a game and you have some footage. And whether you have a full game, we can negotiate that. Or if you have certain little pieces that you want to show. And a nice small group of us will huddle up, huddle up, huddle up. And we will talk through the things that you would like to talk about. Whether that's very general, like, hey, what do you see here? Are there things that I can prove? Or... Maybe it's something very specific. Hey, did I manage that situation to the with the best result? Did I get the outcome that I was looking for there? So there you go. Casper wanted to be a new rule. Um, Leela, agreed. 
if I've missed something obvious in the, in my far side, then please take that decision in my circle. Yeah. When it's a free hit, when it's a corner, you have the opportunity to, to keep playing a little bit. It's okay. And if the ball like ends up starting to go outside your circle and then you've got your friend in the, in your ear and you probably have some form of demonstration happening from the attackers to let you know that maybe you missed something. And then your friend is giving you the nice big signal. Look at that. Oh, that looks here. I'll just point it straight at the camera. <laughs> um, they'll give you that nice big signal, which again is something that you talk about in your pregame chat or they'll tell you in your, so that should help. Oh man. So Niels is just popping the, popping the, the, the yellow benefits. That's incredible. And you get the rank on the Discord server as well. So yes, what we're doing with yellow in the Discord, sorry, I feel very today. What we're doing with, with yellow and with green in the Discord is I'm better able to give you some secret, exclusive benefits uh, in that form. We can do our watch parties in there and it's a lot easier than doing them on Facebook because Facebook... Is terrible and yes it's 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 a great way that we can deliver that extra mentorship and that sort of thing so go sign up go sign up for y'all go sign up for the discords and every so often i'll open up a watch party to green members because i'm nice that way and did you know that there is a big tournament coming up i think it's called the oh yeah, the Olympics are coming up and there will be watch parties going like crazy. I'm going to be shifting to nocturnal time. I am never going to look this good doing a watch party because it's going to be two in the morning and I will have been up and I will have slept for maybe six hours during the day. Yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be, a, no, you don't need to buy anything more. I'll, You've already done it. There you go. It does keep getting better and better. I guess I do a really terrible job at talking about what I'm doing with the third team. I feel uncomfortable doing marketing stuff. I'm not like that. Um, okay. We have our first troll for the day. Excellent. Oh, let's see. Scott, what did you have for me? I say, make sure that I'm not playing advantage before you do, which is, yep. Signaled and shouted, and that's what you ask your colleagues to do as well. That's a really good point, Scott. Thanks for bringing that up, that you you do want to make sure. And that's why, that's why as well, penalty corners are, or strokes are going to be your entire purview because you, are, as the controlling umpire, will have a unique view as to the opportunities that are developing. But that's why it's really important that you communicate because you not only do the players need to know the coaches, the dogs standing with their owners behind the fence, but your colleague needs to know what you're thinking as well. And that will help them understand the flow of the play, what you're seeing, what you're seeing together, and you'll be much more on the same page. So really great point, Scott. Thank you for that. Okay. So let's get on to our first question. En français. Was that really bad French? Probably. James. Okay, I can't see this at all. I don't know what's happening. It, when, I, when I screenshot from YouTube, the font is... It doesn't show up very well. Okay. So we had a lengthy discussion, I think it was last week. <laughs> COVID brain. Um, on ball placement and stopping the ball on free hits. And there were a few people that really did check in on that concept of, well, but the rules say it has to be stopped stationary. And I say, every rule is subject to 12.1. <laughs> That's kind of my blanket, like, okay, let's, let's just keep that in mind. And every rule has to be considered in the context of who gains a benefit, who is disadvantaged, and does it matter? All these things. We can be informed. We get our information about those three things from 
applying the principles of what is the rule trying to prevent? Not just what is the what what does the word say or what the definition of that word means? No. We have to take it all within a bigger context. So we ha- we were having lots of discussions and I had lots of side discussions with people on the discords about stopping the ball. And then James brought this out on YouTube and it's a really good point. Um, what do I do? What do we do when a defender who's won a free hit in the circle stops the ball dead, looks up, but finds they don't have any quick take options they like. So they then start to top, tap the ball to bring it up to the full 15 meters that they are allowed to move the ball to. Then the other team will rush them and claim the hit was taken since the ball was stationary and the place of the hit was, in their view, established. And to complicate matters, I've also occasionally had defenders do this and then they hit a very much rolling ball that the other team clearly wasn't expecting to be hit until it was stopped again. And then the defender will claim to have taken the self-pass in the circle. Hi, Rich. Good to see you. So let's see. Casper, did I discuss the Germany uh, PC innovation startup at both PC places left and right? How to manage? Yes, I have talked about that, Casper. And tell you what, come into the discords and bug me about it. And myself and the crack moderating team will find where we have talked about that in previous. I have definitely talked about it in a previous What of Wednesday, maybe a couple. So we will find that for you. Okay, it'll happen. But that's a great place to sort of flush that out. Cool, cool, cool. And I'm going to show you how to search on my website soon. But, okay. Squirrel, squirrel. Let's do this. <laughs> Thank you for chiming in, everybody in the comments. I absolutely love it. And it's... If this feels like a game where I've just got all these, all these things, all these decisions flying at me. It's awesome. Okay. So these are, are complicated situations that we need to pare back to the basics in order to manage them properly. And I think what we have to always get back to, and just like Nick just popped in the comments, always be thinking about 12.1, always be thinking about what is advan- advantageous or not. So the simple notion of a defender stopping the ball, looking up to see if they have any options, not liking what they have, and then tapping the ball up to the 50 meter mark, that in and itself shouldn't be anything that we're super bothered with. What are they gaining from that? They're simply, they they have the right to make a decision as to whether they are going to take the ball from less than 15 meters or up at the top if they wish. That's fine. Just because the ball is stationary doesn't mean that that is the place from which they have decided to take their free hit. There's nothing in the rules that says that the ball has to stay in motion in order for us not to be confused as to whether that's going to be the spot of the free hit. Okay. The advantage that they would gain would be if they suck the uh, pressing attackers into jumping the five meters too soon and you as the umpire penalizing it. Okay, so I have a few examples of, and interestingly, every example I found was one team doing it. (laughs) I'm not saying that they're cheater pants. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, they, they have clearly learned this as a team tactic in order to try to get a player carded. Long corner. Close to the left hand side. Ockenden. So here's one here. South passes, face with Hertzberger, goes back again. Where there's a little bit of a dribble inside, the self pass comes, and then the player stops a little bit, the and then corner. instead of continuing Close at the, the self pass, they've just dribbled, dribbled it a little bit over. Sorry, South let me mute passes, that for us. That's too loud. 
So they just take the really minor self-pass from outside, inside, and then they come to a dead stop and they create that confusion in the attacker. Now, what's important here is that you've got a, a, an umpire who's stepping up to make themselves present in the play, and they're going to be there to be able to communicate to the players. So what you can do, and what I would recommend that you do in this situation, is you let the players know what you've seen and how you are going to apply the rule. And say, yep, that's taken. Nope, not yet. Very easy. Because you are the boss of this situation, not them. Okay. So in this case, that little dribble, I would have, if I were the queen of the world, I would have been walking up to saying, yep, that's played. That is not coaching. I've, I've heard a few people um, asking me, oh, my scene. <laughs> my overlay. Sorry, everybody. So I've, I've had people ask things like, if the ball hasn't traveled outside the, the circle on a penalty corner, if you tell the players that it hasn't left yet, are you coaching them? I say, no, you're not coaching them because you're not telling them what to do. You are informing them of what you've seen and you're informing both teams and both teams have a myriad of choices that they can make based on the information you've given them. That's not coaching. That's just communication. Nice, proactive, important communication because what you're there for is not to be a gotcha umpire. You're not there to surprise people with your astounding knowledge of obscure rules and ha ha, I got you now. You're there to get the game flowing and to help the players play their best. Not for you to umpire your best. That's just, you're doing that on the side, on the down low all the time. You're there to let the players do their thing. <laughs> Good to see you, Kat. Warm welcome to you. So I, I think that's, that's one of the first premises that, that you have to establish is that you have the ability as an umpire to communicate to the players what you're seeing and how you're interpreting the situation. If I saw a player you know, let the ball come to a stop or stop it in front of the, the 15 meter and then start tapping it. I would just, I would just very quietly, I do that little, I wouldn't do the balloon letting out that we, that we heard at the Euros. That's, that was just getting a little bit overdone, but just quick beep. Hey everybody. No, we're just, we're just going to set it up here. Okay. Nobody gets disadvantaged nobody's shirts have to get shorts have to get in a knot just let's just reset it everything's fine but if you have players who are taking the mick on a regular basis and they're doing some of the things that we're going to see in the next couple clips you also have the ability to talk to those players and say would you knock that off you're not fooling me and i am going to let things play you can talk, not with the swear, you can talk to players through that and let them know. The whole question here is, and I'm, I don't say this to be disparaging, but are you smarter than the players that you're playing against, that, not, that you are umpiring? Can you express to them that you understand what their intentions are and that they're not going to fool you? That's all I'm saying. So here's, an, here's another example of a bit of an ambiguity, okay? The ball goes off for a sideline hit, and there's a little bit of a stop. There's another stop. It's a little bit here. I'm going to turn the sound on because I want you to hear the whistling work from, I, have the ball on the line uh, I think it's Simon Taylor, Taylor who's out there. In the right spot. Okay. So we're going to show this again. So the ball goes off the side and very close to the 23. It's really helpful in this case to actually indicate to the players already what you want. Okay. And Simon does give a couple peeps to make sure that that ball comes onto the sideline. Because this gets a little confusing as to where he's intended to take it. Has he taken it? 
Where is it stationary? All you have to do is just reset it. Have the ball on the line. And then maybe give them a knock it off. Right spot. Unfortunately, hit the post. Jensen. Okay. Let me know if you have any questions on this one or if you have any sort of, you know, inquiries, that sort of thing. Yo, exactly. It's the same as shouting play on. And I mean, you can argue that play on is actually more instructive and more coaching than saying something like no foul. Because you're actually telling one or you're actually telling both teams to continue to do one thing, which is continue to play. How they play is a totally different issue, but that's a really good point. It's very, very much the same thing. Mark Cummings. Good to see you, friend. So when it gets even trickier is in this kind of situation. And this is something that this clip is sitting in the clip library and we've had lots of discussions of it. Let me find the volume on this one. And there's no way Van Overly. Okay. The signs. So Australia wins a free hit low. Ockenden finally gets his stick on the ball. Good work from Eddie Ockenden. If at first you don't succeed, try and try again. Okay, no so he does exactly five. what James is asking about in this situation. Is he not? Hmm, Simon Taylor. Okay. That's being a little generous. And when you listen to, I think that's Charlie. Anyway, when you listen to the commentator, and what I'm saying is there is... That there is the possibility that that first play, even though it was on the, the reverse signs. stick, and we don't do a good job as umpires in Ockenden processing that, gets his stick on the ball. and seeing that despite the fact the ball was played with the reverse stick from behind his body, that can absolutely be the start of the self-pass. That could actually be the taking of the free hit. And what... Ockenden is trying to do there is he's trying to earn. You can see him. Hey, my arms are out. Come on, umpire. He's trying to get Van Obel carded. <laughs> Simon, of course, smarter than an exceptionally experienced uh, player. And what I would do in this particular situation as well, Simon calms everything down, resets it, and explains to Van Obel, no, I understand. I know there's some ambiguity there. I get it. Okay, it's cool. But I would like him to turn around to Ockenden and say, knock that off. I know what you're trying to do. And the next time, that tackle will be legal and off to the races. Van Obel. The second feint in there is even more than what James' scenario was describing. And that is where I would give them one chance at this confusion. And that is it. Okay. Does that all make sense? Does that all help you with some, some tools and some proactivity? I think... One of the things that we tend to get into is we get, we get trapped in our head processing information and then we fail to do two things. As soon as we think, our feet stop moving and we stop talking. Talking is a great way to stop yourself from thinking. <laughs> talking to the players and expressing what you're seeing is a great way to, to just get outside of this internality and we think it's happening. We think that people can read our minds and the players can read our minds and know that we're not happy with this or we're, we're war we've warned about that or anything like that. But if it's not out there, it's still in here. So use your voice and communicate with the players and let them know. And they will process that information. I'm dancing and they will understand what remedies and what decisions you're going to make in the future. No surprises, right? There are no surprises in umpiring. You are letting the players know what you expect, and then you follow through on those expectations. Just like that. <laughs> Gian, you're right. Um, 
I am not here to out anybody who happened to have had a fall on the pitch. However, if a certain someone wasn't fined appropriately for falling on the pitch, you need to re- or re-examine your life choices, friends. So James, yep, that's broadly the kind of case I was trying to describe. I actually find the case of the attacker doing it like that easier to deal with because ultimately they've just hurt themselves. Yeah, when handled well, like in that case. Absolutely. <laughs> I, it really did. It sounded good in here. And then when I spoke it out loud, I realized it sounded really st- stupid. There you go. So by the, oh, the attacker being the player in possession, who was exactly, right? So if you don't buy into what the player taking the 15 meter free hit or the free hit that was awarded less than 15 meters, if you don't buy into their malarkey and you reset everything, you're giving the defensive team an opportunity to arrange their structure in front of the ball which is not like that player is trying to take advantage of them not being organized and trying to earn a card. So if you don't do any of those two things, they don't gain an advantage from that behavior. If you don't let them, if you don't buy into the, the malarkey. So I hope that does that help James? I hope that that's given you some tools. Tell me if, I, if, if that hasn't been enough. Be demanding. Be demanding. Okay. I love the third team. You're awesome. And sorry, Mark said, my pleasure. Okay, Kat, that almost self-passes annoying and reminds me of soccer players who are trying to trick umpires to card people. Yes. <laughs> Right? We don't like that. Yeah, it's a bit harder when the tackling player is breaking down a play that could have been a self-pass, which everyone realistically knows wasn't. And again, so the technique there is to use your whistle and use your voice to let the player know early that that hasn't been taken yet. So if everybody realistically knows it's not a self-pass and it hasn't been taken, then you're using your voice to say, no, 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 not yet, not yet. Keep your five. Because then they're getting the advantage, but they have plausible deniability, which makes handing out a card or something look harsh. And that's why you just reset everything. Just reset it all. Once. <laughs> You are not doing that multiple times in a match. If it's, if you have determined, you are the one who determines when the self-pass, when the free hit has been taken and you communicate that and then you let the play continue. That happens the next time because you're saying, hey guys, guess what? You don't get to make the decision. I make the decision. You are the boss of you. Simon, I discussed with my colleague at halftime that a player was trying to get people carded. Turned out the player was my colleague's daughter and she disagreed. (sighs) Yeah. Awkward. It happens, right? And that's okay. Stick to your guns. Show me a clear difference. Otherwise, it'll be play on. Absolutely. Thanks, Lula. Great suggestion. I've always refused to empire family to avoid that situation. Yeah. I spend most of my time in Calgary umpiring people I've known for 30 years. But I don't like people in general, so it works out fine. Okay. I hope that was thorough and excellent. And if you want to follow up on that or any other topic that we have today, please go over to the Discord. And join in. It's free. Okay. Where are we? (laughs) I had a 
whack of questions. Oh, okay, but first, before I do that, I, I wanted to show you guys something because I still get lots of DMs from people and I've realized that maybe I haven't shown you a trick. Okay, it's not a trick. It's a basic skill. But for example, I get this question, James, how do you handle free hits that are ambiguous and what do you do? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go find some clips. Sometimes I remember clips, but usually I only remember pieces of them. Like, well, I know it's the Australian men and I can sort of see the shapes of the players in my mind, but I'm like, but where am I going to find it in my myriad? I probably, for all the near to 600 clips that I have in the clip library, I've probably got another 400 sitting in my hard drive (laughs) that I haven't been able to organize and post to the clip library. So I'm like, how am I going to find it? So I Google myself and I go over to the website. (laughs) Crazy times. There's two ways that you can find things in the website. And if you are a yellow member in particular, one technique that you might want to use is to go to, go to the FHU 3T dropdown, click on the clip, clip, click on the clip library. And then you can, I don't know, you can just go watch some random clips if you want. But for example, I was saying, okay, I know that this is a five meter infringement on a free hit. So I'm going to highlight that as a foul or decision. And I know it was Australia. So I'm going to highlight that team and then I'm going to hit filter. And there it is. It's the number two result because that searches tags that I have associated with particular clips. Boom. I can then go click on it and I can see, I can read the clip. I can read what some random intelligent person um, wrote as an explanation and I can go see comments that people have said and we have a, a nice little exchange about it. That is one of the things that you get from being an FHU 3 team member. But let's say you just wanted to find some things about the South Pass and ball placement. I have a general search bar. And so you could type in your search terms. And actually, I'm going to use the same search terms that I'm going to look. Uh, Actually, let's do self pass management. This search bar is going to search not only the clip library, friends. Oh, no. So much more than that. It's actually going to search through What Up Wednesdays and descriptions and titles that I've associated with that and transcripts. L that we have added. So you can go find everything that I've talked about, every, every clip that I've posted, everything about a particular subject and issue. And then what you do is you copy the link and you put it in the discord and then you start a conversation over there. So if you didn't know this was possible, friends, let me tell you, this is, I didn't even know I didn't even know how dope this was going to be when I built it, but it truly is a lifesaver for me. It makes finding material to teach y'all so quick and easy and stress-free. And if you are a yellow member, you get access to all that. If you are an association who would like to be able to find material that you can use for your discussions, for your workshops and your seminars, you join as a red member and then you have access to download this stuff and use it. And I'm there to support you and make sure to explain things and help and offer workshops and do all kinds of stuff. So I hope that was helpful. I hope that was helpful. Let's see what, (laughs) there have been many, many conversations that was helpful as an umpire, as a player to know, to choose your one time. Pl- exactly. Exactly. And I have no problem with this. Like people think that if players break rules, it's like an insult to umpires and you should get mad and stuff. It's like, no, I only get mad 
if you're being rude to me or you're putting somebody else in danger, if you're just testing the waters and you're just seeing like where my limits are, I'm like, you're smart. I appreciate that about you. This is the line. Now, don't you step over it, right? Give me an opportunity to show you what I expect. And truly fun, competitive games have those elements in there. If players aren't pushing you as an umpire, it's, it's not very fun, is it? It's just kind of boring. Okay. <laughs> Where is Cindy? Is she on the, you got to get her on the show. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to screenshot this. Screenshot it. That's awesome. Um, and there you go. There's the link to the website, <laughs> just in case you didn't know. Elle watched a game where the younger brother was umpiring older sister's teams when they played against each other. <laughs> I can't even imagine. And it was a long walk home, says Leela. <laughs> very, very funny. And the opponents didn't help her out. There you go. Absolutely. No, Elle, don't worry. I totally appreciate you. But this is, this is what we're aiming for, right? Because if we can get more words in there and more weird, killy phrases, if somebody wants to search for every time I've used the phrase cheater pants, one word, by the way, it's in the Keely Dunn style guide. If you want to search out every time I've talked about cheater pants, <laughs> you can go. Let's do it. No, there's, there's not going to be any results. Or if I've, every time I've said scales of justice, or every time there was an aerial into the D, every time there was an aerial in a card, zero results. Anyway, so many great things in there. Thank you. And Simon says, L is doing a great job. Thank you. James, you had a co-umpire this season ask you at quarter time to card a player next quarter if they acted up. Said he couldn't because it was his state team coach and he didn't want burpees. That's awkward. Roger, the attacker called for an aerial when it was going over the def going over the defender. He thought it was a teammate, so left it. Told the defender there's no offense to call for it. Yeah, there isn't. There is no offense to call for it. There's no offense in tricking each other. I, I've i seen this pop up on forums. Roger, this is, this is a nice little um, side topic. Thank you for throwing in lots of little questions as we're going along. Squirrel. It fits. Um, where players will do the, they'll, they'll slam their stick on the ground to be like, I'm coming after you. And it's, it's often when the player is chasing and they'll be like, bang, bang, bang on the ground. Thump, thump. So the way that I handle things like that is by telling that player that they look stupid. <laughs> like, knock that off. You look like a Muppet. <laughs> that usually does the trick. Unless they are actually intimidating a player. And if you get intimidated by that, mm, I'm not sure if you should be on a hockey pitch. Or they're actually creating some danger somehow. There's nothing to intervene on. But you have the option of your communication and the way that the manner in which you communicate that message to those players to fix the problem. Exactly. Exactly. There are no rights afforded to a player who calls for it. And that's a nice way that you can deal with that situation and say, well, if you believe that he has the right to the ball because he's called for it, you don't understand the rule at all. <laughs> I think Neil's just kind of Rick rolled everybody in a different way. Absolutely. So the, Yeah. It, the guys are doing it in indoor. I'd be like, yo, you. <laughs> oh, like it was like it's a water splash. Yeah. It happens in indoor a lot. I think it's a, okay. Maybe I don't know how to play the game, but I think it's a lot more fun 
to run up behind a player without them knowing that they're, I'm there <laughs> and make them and, and invite them into my den, into my spider web of tackle. What am I talking about? I can't tackle. I know, Niels. Okay. Let's get on to my friend on the YouTubes, Rajasekhar, Rajasekhar Hockey Coach. And if I've said that wrong, I apologize. I will do better. He had three questions. <laughs> so I'm going to separate them out and talk about them quickly. Um, what is the difference between rules and regulations? And this is, I like this as a, as a question, the difference between rules and regulations, because people get confused about this all the time. Cause they'll say to me things like, what's the rule on players wearing shin guards? And I'll say, there isn't one. It's not a rule. Your league may have a regulation regarding that. They might ask me, what's the rule on what colors the, play, the, the team can wear? And aside from the fact they all have to wear the same color, there isn't a rule. But your league may have regulations regarding that. So the rules of hockey are meant to apply everywhere to everyone. So the aerial ball rule danger, not using your feet, all those kind of things, goalkeepers, only having goalkeeper privileges inside the circle. Those things apply everywhere. And technically speaking, the only time you can vary those are when you go through your national association, who then goes to the FIH and says, we don't want to apply this rule. Can we not apply it? And ask for permission and get it from the FIH. In practice, when it's things like the timing of games, for example, you know, when the whole quarters thing came in, a lot of jurisdictions, a lot of jurisdictions did not adhere to that rule. And that is a rule in hockey, but it's also a very much a technical aspect of how the rules are played. So it's, it's like a regulation that they elevated into the rules and put it there. So, but aside from that, the basics of how we actually play the game inside the pitch, player, a player versus those are rules and what is in, what is contained in the rules of hockey. Regulations are the manner in which leagues, um, tournament organizers, whatever the case might be, how they organize a competition to occur, a match to occur. So whether the players have to have numbers, whether um, certain players are eligible to play, um, whether there need to be corner flags on the side of the pitch, um, issues like that. Those are the manner, those are the, the, the purview of regulations. And they're there specifically because different people, different areas have different needs and different levels of competition have different needs. So if you're playing a national championship in Canada, you need to be able to establish that players are actually from that province, for example. And it's a big competition. So we want numbers and we want to, you know, we want to make this more official and more formal because there's a lot on the line. There's provincial funding on the line. So we have a set of regulations in place. Do we follow all those regulations when we go back to our local competition in the city of Calgary? Hell no, because it doesn't matter. So we have a different set of regulations there. So I'll often be asked about a rule on this and I'll say, that's nah, a regulation. So if you didn't know, if you want to know what's happening on the FIH level, for regulations, man, I'm, I'm just, I'm going crazy with the, um, on-screen demonstrations here on the fly to find out what happens at the FIH level. You would go to inside FIH, our official documents, look at how fast my internet is. And this gets confusing 
Hey, look, rules of hockey. That's a good place to look. But event resources are where you're going to find regulations. You'll find bidding documents. Fascinating. We're not going to talk about that. Event requirements and event manuals, codes of conduct, competition policies, event field specifications. Oh, it's just so exciting. But then down here, you've got a whole schwacko of tournament regulations. And as you can see, there are regulations for the World Cups 2018. There's the Rio 2016 regulations because the Olympics are a totally different animal. You've got indoor regulations. You've got the Asian Games. You've got, we're not going to talk about that one. You've got general tournament regulations, top tier tournament regulations. And we had a, a chat on the Discord about what a top tier event is and what it isn't. And luckily it actually defines it when you go here. These regulations apply to the FIH Olympic qualification events, the FIH Hockey World Cup qualification events, and the FIH Hockey Junior World Cup. Okay. So this is where you find all the stuff about how big do the numbers have to be and who decides when there's an event of conflict. This is where you find the video referral, video umpire regulations. Okay, it's there. And look at me searching on the internet as we go. Four of 26 matches. Video umpire. I'm going to do this. This is actually faster. There is Appendix 13, Video Umpire. So you can search through these regulations. You can find the answers you're looking for, either because you're curious or because you are part of a competition and you're trying to find maybe a best practice of how your tournament should be run. And then you go through and you say, yeah, we don't have a Video Umpire, so we'll XNA Appendix 13. So that is the difference between... Rules and regulations. Does anybody have any questions on that? Let's see. I'm going to... Leela, you're going to physio. How did you get injured? Or are you just... Are you just rehabbing baby? I hope it's okay. Yeah, like I said, it could be intimidating, but... You don't have the ball. So if you're actually threatening to hit somebody, we're talking red card territory, right? So that's where that goes. Maybe, Casper, I've talked about this as well. Um, here, I'm going to star this and come back to it and just make sure that I've got all the regulations questions if there are any. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm starring all these comments now because this is good. Okay, nobody cares about the regulations. We're going to talk about the stick over the head. You guys are dope. So, starting with here, starting not with here, start, starting further back. So, Casper's uh, question point comment that lifting over the, the stick over the head should be whistled much more often. So I talked to, I think it came up in at least two of the conversations on umpire at home with Adam Kearns. I know with Lim may have talked about it with Tomo. I don't remember who the third was, but I asked them because I wanted to understand better. So why is this being tolerated at the top levels? when it is and when do you sometimes clamp down on it? And their explanation to me was this, was that first of all, yes, the wording in the rule says never, as Casper rightly points out, but still we as hockey umpires still apply, as Scott pointed out, advantage rules and what actually makes a difference. And as Adam and Lim explained it to me, it is sometimes the safer way to play because if they get caught up, as Nick's talking about here, if, if the players are really close to each other and one player is very low, it's actually more dangerous for them to take the stick around the horn. Okay, this is driving me crazy. That's just coming off. 
they need going around the horn down low would actually take the stick by the player's head. So there's assumption built into that rule. And that will be nine something. Let me go find it. Um, must not change the stick. Must not throw. Approach. They must not. Ah. Oh. Well, this is fun. So Casper, the word never is not in the rule. This is why it's always good to go back to the rule book. Let's see if I can, uh, if I can pull this up properly. Okay, I'm going to do this. Don't worry, friends. I'm a professional. Don't try this at home. Okay. So here's my super duper awesome PDF rules of hockey. If you don't have this as a shortcut on your desktop or whatever the case might be, who are you and why are we friends? So it's up here at 9-2. Players must not lift their sticks over the heads of other players. Now, as Nick was pointing out and as we were having the discussion about, yes, it can actually be more dangerous to put the stick around. And trust me, I've seen instances where that low player has been struck. And I remember it was the Commonwealth Games and I won't mention specific teams, but there was a little bit of stick work that got caught as a yellow card as a player running by around or attempting a tackle on a player in possession who was very, very low, got struck in the head with the stick. A yellow card was awarded, which was then upgraded to a red card, and a ban was issued for, I think, a single game at the Commonwealth Games. So in that case, if that tackler was looking to get around that player, taking the stick over the head is actually the safer route to go. As always, when we implement a black and white requirement in the rule book, there's always an exception <laughs> that gets thrown out there. And the way that I look at all of these things is as follows. No matter what, I'm still trying to do the best job and to keep players safe as much as possible. And if that, and, and like my friend Matt Harrison loves to say, never let the rules get in the way of a great decision. So I will not penalize a player who is making things safer or is keeping things safe with that gesture. Now, the hard part is, is that yes, that means that there's a subjectivity involved. It means that you could be in the position where a player lifting a stick over a head is dangerous in one case and not dangerous in another. Welcome to umpiring and welcome to what we do every single decision on the pitch. And it'd be nice if we could just rely on 9-2 and make it flat out. But frankly, that's not good umpiring and it's not going to produce a better, safer, more enjoyable game. The other problem with putting black and white rules into the rule book, as this is, is that it gets outmoded as the game evolves. And our game evolves at a quite rapid pace. I wouldn't quite call it a revolutionary pace, but it's definitely a fast evolution. The players are, are constantly innovating, finding new ways to play, different styles of play, developing new skills, and the rules are not keeping pace with that. And this is a rule that hasn't kept pace with the fact that players are now playing much lower to the ground in some situations. Back when I started playing, back when I started playing, Shunny, we were very upright. We were playing on grass. Every, our sticks were vertical. Everything was happening up there. So yeah, putting your stick over the head of a player was awful. And they're talking about that granny dodge that we used to do. That was the core skill that I had on the pitch, granny dodge around one side. And they didn't want you doing this over the head of the player to reach the ball on the other side. I didn't even bother doing that. I just, I just stayed low and I got the call anyway. And I'm like, thank you very much. And then I'd take my free hit. 
back when then that when that was actually the way we interpreted obstruction and thank goodness the game doesn't do that anymore because skill like that should not be rewarded from players like me so casper i hope that helps i know and this is this is the argument casper that that it sets an example but they're not there to be incorrect. They're not there to wreck a game just because we're not applying a better standard down at lower levels. That's why I'm here. That's why we are talking today. That's why we are having this discussion and why we go out into our hockey communities and we then pass on this education and we develop a stronger, smarter, better hockey culture of coaches, players, spectators, dogs, umpires who understand how to apply this seemingly amorphous, ambiguous entity that is our rule book. And I do not subscribe to the policy and I will argue to the death that I will not subscribe to black and white rules applications just because it makes things easier at lower levels because it doesn't. It makes the game worse at lower levels too. Easy to understand and to play. I got on a rant. Thank you. Scott, advantage 12.1 and danger before everything else. Thank you. Locally, I have a problem with unnecessary sticks over the head. Yes, absolutely. You whistle that more often. You say, nonsense. You don't have to do that. You're not keeping the player more safe by doing that. And yes, very different from good faith attempts to play safely. Thanks, James. That's very helpful. Okay. Absolutely. Um, every single rule in the rule book... Every single rule under nine, players on the field must hold their stick and not use it. Players must not touch, handle, or interfere with other stick. Players must not. The word must is in every rule. It doesn't mean that we apply it black and white. Because we have this. 12.1, a penalty is awarded only when a player or team has been disadvantaged by an opponent breaking the rules. Always, always, always. Rachel Davids has multiple rule books in your Dropbox. Yes, me too, friend, me too. Uh, as soon as they started publishing in them as PDFs, I collected them. So I have, I think I go back to 2013 or 2015. I think 2015 was when that really took off and they stopped distributing the actual physical rule books. So if you, if you've seen some of my really Tuesdays where I go into the history of a rule, which is the most exciting thing in the world, I really should stop doing that, but it's hard because I think, I don't know. I like the, I like the contextual aspect of it, but, um, I will actually take a picture <laughs> of the page in the rule book. I should probably just scan the whole thing and just get those, but I'll go back to 2003. If you need, I go back to 2001 actually is my earliest physical rule book. Cause that's just as I was stop. Excellent. Also point Scott. Thank you. You're very good at catching the things that I miss. When the phrase is in italics, it is cemented in the rule book. That is considered guidance, a way to shape your interpretation. So they're just adding this information to the 9.2 rule. But always, always, like you don't even have to hang your hat on that. You can hang your hat on 12.2, 12.1. Damn it. Better for the attacker so they don't get held up. Yeah, because you're just, you're trying to create that flow. Casper, if you need to crack down on this because players are doing that and it's dangerous, then crack down on it. Nobody's, nobody's stopping you from doing that. 
You make the right call in your game, in your situation, in your context. But don't look at those international umpires and start telling them that they're making the wrong call in their situation, in their context, with their skill level, and their understanding of what players are trying to accomplish. Because that's not how it works. <laughs> Is this how I'm supposed to treat new people on the, on the stream? Probably not. Sorry. I do get very passionate about it. Yes. Yes. And that's because it, this guidance came in because of that generation of players. That generation of players right there. They were the ones that were doing it. Dangerously. And there were certain, yes, just that generation play. Let's just leave it at that. That's the right way. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Scott. It is very clear. Absolutely. <laughs> Parent. I mean, I'm a master's player now, so I agree. Always foul and rarely right. <laughs> So L, the way you phrase that is, Berend, you misspelled it. Let me correct you. Veterans always fall in a really right. That's better. That's the Twitterish. There you go. Okay, Yelp. Okay, there is a may. They may stop. And then it goes right back to must in nine point eight. I'm just saying that must is in the. It, it's not a particular point of emphasis. It's the way. You, it's the way that you have to phrase rules or else it's not actually prohibitory. It's just an invitation to play properly. When should you? When it's dangerous. When it actually, you know, goes, when a player is standing upright and there's a high risk of that stick contact and the players don't have the skill to respect each other. Yeah, we do need a poll. I don't know how to make polls. And I've seen a couple of polls on YouTube recently on live streams and they're dope and I don't know how to make them. But I'd like to know. Mods. <laughs> angry eyes. It's angry eyes. Okay, I hope that I hope that helps. And I know that doesn't feel like it's not a hard and fast rule. Guess what? Neither is obstruction. Neither is danger in general. Neither is, even five meters isn't a hard and fast rule because advantage, disadvantage, all those things still come to play. Exactly. And Leela and I speak from experience because we aren't solely elite level umpires. <laughs> we are umpires who now retired, but Leela presently umpires at the top of the game and also umpires grassroots back at home. Last weekend, I got out on the pitch for the first time in 16 months and I was doing under 14 girls and boys because it's fun and I enjoy it and I like being able to serve and contribute. Don't tell me I don't know what grassroots play is and how to handle things. And I know it's hard to adjust your standards. From here, wait, from here to here. Lining it up. Oh, I can't do it. There. That's a screenshot for you. <sighs> Pull. You don't have editor permissions. Okay. Well, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. It's good. That was a great question. Thank you very much for that, Casper. <laughs> Now this isn't a popularity contest. This is a this is a battle of ideas. Two very different things. Okay. Now that we got completely World. off the other ones. Do we want to talk about this one? An important What is the importance of an umpire? Okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to change my sound effect and I'm going to let you I would like to hear from you. In one sentence, what is the importance of an umpire? I'll wait.
This is great. Because I know what I think. Although I don't know if I can express it as concisely in one sentence or not. For me, since I'm still waiting for comments to come in, here it comes. Yeah, that's their purpose. Very good point, Niels. Sports requires a neutral arbiter. Why? We keep the game f amazing, flowing, fun, and see, safe and fair. Thanks, Gideon. When I was in the Belgian Hockey Association, I asked some Red Panthers off the cuff. The answer was, there would be no game. Hi, Anik. Good to see you, friend. Anik was also in the workshop yesterday. Safe and fair. Yes. Getting back to Stain's point, there is no game without umpires because without umpires, it's practice. Because without someone enforcing the rules, as Niels pointed out, if you don't have a neutral arbiter of the rules, you're just practicing. You're just training. Because otherwise, you can't compete. There, this is the fundamental tension of the officiating rule, is that players need you in order to compete. But they hate the fact that you are there to tell them what is okay and what is not okay. And that's why we have to work so hard to show them that we're not here against them, we're here with them. And we are producing a competitive game with them. We are the third team on the pitch. And we win when the players play their best game possible. Hi, friends. Hi, Mr. Blackman. If you were a biased arbiter, well, I don't want you anywhere near sport. And this is why, um, like, the, so, so Digital Buddha, David Blackman, is um, from outside our third team community, but it's, it's a nice point to think about and to raise because I've talked about how one of my conditions for a straight red card, hey, what? oh, I'm still on that screen. One of my conditions for a straight red card is if a player accuses me of bias. And people go, whoa, Keely, that's, that sounds kind of strict. That sounds like maybe you're overreacting a bit. I'm like, no, no, that is the fundamental, fundamental underpinning of why I'm here. If I am not neutral, if I am biased, and if you are undermining the, the integrity to, with which I am approaching this game by accusing me of that, I am no longer an umpire. And this is no longer a game. So you, individual player, do not get to destroy that. Here's your red card. Off you go. It is the gravest insult that I can be faced with. And I don't know if you all feel the same way. If you don't, if you don't think it's that bad, I, I'd be interested in hearing from you. But I think it is. I think it's right there. <laughs> yeah. And basically that gets back to us being the arbiters. And we just simply have to be trusted. And we have to earn that trust and we have to maintain that trust and we have to build it every time we are out on the pitch. We could discuss why football has referees from their history. P.S. We are superior. Obviously. <laughs> I was on my other sound bank. I thought that was going to be this one. Casper, I need you to explain Wayne, which would I advise this at lower levels to? What is this? Because I've advised many things today. I need to know which one it is. Red card to the coach. Um, yeah, when you're, Anik, this, this ties back to what we were talking about. Maybe um, you, you popped in a little bit later, but we did talk about the difference between rules and regulations. And we 
under the rules of hockey, we cannot card coaches. We can card players on the pitch and players on the bench. We cannot card coaches. They are not captured under the rules of hockey. However, you may have regulations in your area that allow you to do that. You may have technical um, technical people. If a coach in my league where we don't have any cardings of coaches whatsoever ever accused me of something like that, I'd be going straight to the league with a complaint and I would be going to the disciplinary committee and explaining to them what had happened. I would eject them from the game, but it's not a red card because a red card is a suspension of a player from the pitch. So two different issues. And sorry, I'm happy to talk about that more thoroughly at another time. Keely Hour. Yeah, everybody feels that that so far is there. Keely Hour has passed. Thank you. It's good to have a timer. Um, are, you at le- are you late? Sir. Peter. Haven't seen you for a bit. Good to have you back. Um, in the Dutch rules, you can. Okay, so there you go. That's a great example of a regulation. And if that is something that you, in your experience, in your area that you need to do, I personally have never been accused. Not on the pitch. I've, you know, had side words and whispers and things like that to which I'm like, let's go out to the parking lot. You and me right now. James, definitely red card bad. (laughs) But I'll usually give a second chance in the form of calling over the captains of the player and asking if anyone has any problems if it was said in the heat of the moment. And if they want to apologize and then follow up the red card if they stand by at all. Okay, that's that's a fair way of handling it. And you're right. Um, If there's any opportunity for me to have misheard what I think I've heard, yeah, that makes sense. I gotcha. Nick, fair play. International football referees have to contend with incredible levels of coercion, corruption, and threats because of the money involved. Yeah. And I've been, I've been thinking about this in the context. So remember when, remember that time at band camp, we talked about the red card to De Ritter in the hoofed class final between Kampong and Blumendahl and Brinkman took the dive. And how I said, we can't sleep on this. We have to start carding this right now because we're seeing it in our top level games because it's becoming more important. We are elevating this game to a form of professionalism. We're always talking about how we're trying to get like football with all the big money and the broadcasting and the sponsorships and all that. Well, you know what? With that... With great power comes great responsibility, said a wise woman to a superhero one day. And that means that we need to, we we have the example set for us. We know what mistakes other sports have made. And we have the opportunity to not make those mistakes. Rugby doesn't make those mistakes. So it's not inevitable. It's not inevitable that with money and sponsorship and professionalism and television and globalism that those things will accrue. They will not if you do it right. Unlike how that other sport has done it. I really, and this is why I really don't like football. Bad sport. Bad sport. And we're good sport. But we have to Manage our business. We have to handle it. Those would be Dutch regulations. Um, Let's see. Would I advise to give a red card for this at lower levels? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Did I say absolutely enough times? Do I need to say it again? (laughs) Yeah. And I'm not saying that you have to like, I guess to me, 
I, I understand what you're aiming for with the mitigation, James. But players have to understand that there's consequences to very serious actions. That is a very serious action. And if you bring players together on the pitch and, you know, some players yelled out, you biased cheat, you are robbing of this game and they go on a tirade and then you bring the captains and the players and then nothing happens to that player. What message is that sending? The damage has been done. And the whole point is, is it in the passion of the moment, that isn't supposed to be what they're thinking. They should just be thinking, I'm really mad they made a mistake. Not, I'm really mad because they're biased. So I'm, I'm okay with that, but that wouldn't be my recommendation in most cases. Like I said, if there's an, a, a chance that you're wrong, if, that you misheard it, or the phrasing was a little off or something like that, if you want to say, what did you say? Maybe, but honestly, I just, I can't see, I can't see why I would step out of that. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's why it's a red card and it's not just a, an ejection from the game. And that is particular for your area. No, it's not. No, it's not just a form of that's what they would argue, that it's just a form of, of appealing. I'm just arguing with you. No, you're not. You're maligning the entire structure of what is happening here in this competitive environment. Because if you think that I'm not neutral, this is not a competition. This is not a game. This is not a match. And you are not here to undermine that integrity of everything that's happening here. I cannot continue in my role if anybody on this pitch actually suspects that I am biased. So you don't get to start that rumor. And if you don't think this is a competition, you go away. You don't get to partake in it anymore. End of story. Wow. <laughs> I didn't expect that to come out quite that much. Yeah, dissent isn't in the rules either. Yeah, that's, that's really hard, Casper. And I have a lot of sympathy for those of you who are club umpires who are umpiring your own clubs. That's very tough. And that's one of the reasons I really dislike that as a practice. And that's why I write big articles in the Hockey World News talking about how important it is that umpires even in COVID times, are neutral appointments for international matches. Because the minute that you undermine that perception of neutrality, everything you do as an umpire is questioned. So you've got an even harder job. And I, I have so much sympathy for that. We, I'm trying to think in my own personal experience, just to relate it to, to how I felt, but here in my local city league, we never umpire our own team. I shouldn't say never. I don't, I have never umpired my own team in which I am either a rostered player or a coach for. I have on a rare occasion umpired a team in a lower division in my club. And as a club leader, I have been very... Mm, I've made it very, um, I've been very overt. I've gone and talked to the other team and said, look, we have a special situation today. Are you comfortable with me? Do you believe I can do an impartial job today? This is why I'm here. This is not the norm. This is not something that we want to do again. And I make sure that the other team understands the position and that they agree to it because it's within their rights to say no in my local competition. Provincially, we aren't always neutral. So if we were at a national competition. But we actually try. We try to, to get that done and balance that out. So you've added that to 14.5. That's a change. But 
you can't add a rule. You can't add rules of hockey. You can add regulations. So sorry, Royal Belgium Hockey Association. That's not the way. That is not the way. Red card for saying. That's your choice, Baran, but I disagree with you for the reasons that I ranted for already. Yep. Well, yeah, I don't think it's an all right sport either, but yes, it has a terrible culture. Um, and after all that ranting, please hit the like button. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Unless they were a hilarious person who I really understood, I'd be giving them a very long look. Yes, rugby refs, absolutely. And that is because the culture is maintained. Can you imagine if you did that in rugby? Okay, I know nothing about how that would work in rugby, but I can only assume from what I've seen and how everybody's called sir, that if that word was trotted on a rugby pitch, that would be an automatic red. And Berend, that is why we are going to follow that kind of standard. That's why it, because it works. Because you have a sport with respect being overtly shown and no horses being released from any barns. No slippery slopes have been embarked upon because they take that very high standard and say, this is it. And you know what? It works. The players understand it. They adhere to it. It's not that hard. So Berend, think about this, okay? I want you to go away for a week and then I want you to come back and talk to me again. Join the Discord, come back, and I want you to tell me what you think in a week. I'm here to change your mind. Very hard. Uh, you only do club games if you're that are not neutral appointments if they're given on that day. Did I understand that right? Yeah, I understand. It's a ah, it's a regulation. Thank you, Stain. I was just gonna be. <laughs> I think, I think I need to get out more and I think I need to relax. A fun question for later. We know not to argue with the umpires during a game. So what's the rule? Another umpire had wrong while you were playing, which you were subsequently able to exploit. Oh my God. I don't think I have enough time for this one. James, let's do this one next week. Cause that's, that is really fun. I would love to talk about this and I'd love to hear your experiences as well. Cause that would be a really fun topic. Cause man, have I ever cheated <laughs> in my life? <laughs> Cheater pants player, that's me. That's why I got recruited into umpiring friends is because people looked around and said, huh, who's the best cheat out there? Oh, that Keely Dunn, she's a pretty sh player, but she sure knows how to, <laughs> how to cheat. True story. Okay, um, we are well over a Keeley hour. I really thank you for hanging in here for that long. I loved the discussion. I loved the opportunity to rant. Thank you for taking my exclamatory remarks in the spirit in which they intended is that I'm just very passionate about this. I want the best for the game. I want the best for us as a third team. And it just, yeah. Like that is not manufactured outrage. That is truly, truly how I feel. And I, I, yeah, I just believe very strongly in it. So thank you for allowing me the space to communicate in this way. Thank you for taking my messages. Thank you for disagreeing with me because it's important. It helps me understand everything better. Uh, thanks for all the great questions. James, come to the discord copy page so that I can get this question for next week because that's going to be dope um ah uh, that's me no question thanks Brend. I'm glad thank you very much it was a great session thanks Gopi I'm glad things are going better in your area I will see you as well very cute labradoodle gamer Lucio and yes are you making me say this on the broadcast? I think you are. Toodle pip. That's adorable. 
If you want to keep chatting, I'm going to head over to the discords and we can continue. So I'm sure that there it is. See you on the discord, like the stream and join the discord. You guys are dope. Um, not sure what I'm going to do for a weekend watch party this weekend, but we'll see. It depends on whether I die after my, whether I am very ill after my second COVID shot. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Casper. I'm glad. I knew because you were Dutch, you were going to be fine with me getting in there. <laughs> Fighting. Oh, great times had by all. Okay. See you next week on What Up Wednesday. That was for you, Elle. Bye, everybody.